So in the meantime, guys, uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions while we're setting this up. I just want to make it's something I used. It's something that we used to do here back actually at Massey in secondary five with uh, one of our history teachers. I'll split the class in half and we'll have a little competition on seeing who, who's going to get the right answers and everything. You're down the middle, so I'm going to say you're... Go on the right. That way. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it's right down the middle. These are the two teams right here. It's very simple. It's not anything complicated. It's things we've already seen or heard before. First question. I'll take it to this side since I've added another member. When is Remembrance Day? Very quick. The actual day. You. November 11th. November 11th. Terrific. Okay. Second question. Very easy. See, I feel it's not that bad. The million dollar question be a little tougher, but we'll see. The second question is, at what time on November 11th do we celebrate, like we have a moment of silence? It's 11. Well, that's for, on this side. 11. 11 a.m. Perfect. Great. Next question is, to this side, why on 11 a.m. on the 11th do we have a moment of silence? Why that day? Why that time? Does anybody know? The sun. I think it's when the war ended. Which war? Not specific enough. First World War. Boom! Anthony <laughs> 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 yeah. Parada. So, yeah. So, it's uh, November. You, 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 yeah, I didn't give him a chance to, uh, to reply, but November 11th. So, 11th minute of the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918 was when the officially World War I ended. And so that's, uh, that's why we celebrate on that day. But we also take that time to remember the rest of the wars and the rest of the veterans. So that's when it started, but we still remember all the other veterans. Another question since they got it. Uh, what is this? This side. Okay, that was an easy one. But why do we write pop? On Remembrance Day. This side still. No, no wrong answers. To remember the soldiers who died in the name of the Exactly. Is there a good one answer? Exactly, also because of Flanders Fields, right? What happened was that back in the day, we would have, in World War I, you used to have what was called a war of attrition. You would have, and you would see this in the movies, like Braveheart, you'd have one camp on this side, and you would fight and against the other guys over here, and everybody runs against each other, and they collide, and the swords are hitting each other, and, and then a bunch of people would just die over here, right? Because everybody's colliding right here. So they would die, and in those fields, like one of them being Flanders Fields, they would just die, and the blood that was spilled on those fields is the red of the poppy, but also because the poppies would actually grow in those fields. So once everybody was dead and you would have tombs, the poppies would still grow between those fields. So, question over here. Who wrote the famous poem, uh, uh, this Field? John McCray. John McCray. Oh, Bonus question. Uh, yeah, do you know why? Yeah, <laughs> nah, it's random. He wrote it. Did you know? Uh, it was like, he was a soldier in that war and like, he was looking and like, he was writing down what he saw. Yeah, exactly, that's good. It was a, he had a friend, a 21-year-old, he's actually a, a Canadian medical officer at the time, and he wrote it for one of his uh, fellow comrades that passed. He was 21 years old, and he saw him in the field, and he wrote that poem. Not many people know that he actually was uh, a doctor here in Montreal at the Royal Victoria Hospital. <clears throat> so, John McRae, Flanders Fields, a poem that is recited in, I think, over 20 languages, during this week around the world was written by a very own Canadian, not only Canadian, but Montreal. So that's uh, something to take away. I remember in grade six, uh, does anybody know the poem? By heart? No? I know half of it. Start it. Uh, in Flanders fields the poppies grow between the crosses row on row. Uh, that mark our place in the sky, the lark still breezy singing fly. Uh, something like scarce. Scarce bird among the many guns below. below. <laughs> we are the dead. Short days ago, we felt on sunset, sunset glow. Loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take our quarrel with the foe. From you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with those who die, we shall not sleep. Because poppies grow in Flanders fields. Good. I used to recite it ever since I was in grade six, and I continued ever since. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. Does anybody know what that means, kind of? Like if, like if some of us fall, there's going to be more people in the future that might take that torch and keep on going. Like, 
We're not going to give up here versus people who will keep going. Exactly, yeah. Literally, like, here's a torch, like you're running in the marathons and the Olympics. You're falling, you're about to fall here. Take our torch. Exactly. Continue, like the relay race. Continue with it. Continue on. Yeah, okay, so that's a good point to be here. Plus, recycling. I think it's kind of tight, man. There's a recycle over here. There's a poem plus this question. You guys are going to have to. Uh, is the million dollar question. Let's see who gets it. We'll decide who wins. To you, from failing hands, we throw a torch for yours to hold it high. We see it in a locker room somewhere. Who knows which locker room, uh, which sports team, do we see this? So do you guys have the answer? First person to ask I, I heard it over here. I heard something over here. Montreal Canadiens? Your man's right. <laughs> Montreal Canadiens locker room has in English on one side to you from failing hands and French on the other side. The reason, same reason like you mentioned, but only for the Montreal Canadiens, all these veterans that that played for the Canadians, that made them such a great team, the great team that we know, one of the best sports dynasties in the world. Every time Montreal Canadiens, the current players are in their locker room, they're looking at these guys with their pictures all over the locker room for inspiration. And that's why in the playoffs, if you see them, sometimes they have a little kid that comes out, hopefully we'll see them eventually, maybe not this year, but next. There's a little kid that comes out with a little torch, and he skates around the hockey rink, and then he comes to the center of the, of the center, of the uh, bell center, and he puts the torch on the hockey rink floor, and then boom, you get this like animation of like a big flame. So that's the reason, it's to carry on from that poem, then to the hockey team to Montreal, showing that the ghosts of the past, the Canadians of the past are here with you, so that you can become a better team in the future. And it's the same thing with the poem itself, guys. It talks about military. I use that to see that from the veterans that we saw and that fought in other wars, like I spoke to them yesterday and all these days. To me, to, for me to serve in my country now, and to just be a normal citizen in, in society, take inspiration from the past, and be who you want to be now in the present. Uh, how much time do I have for half hour? Half hour. Uh, half hour? Yeah, about 27 minutes. Okay, good, good. Guys, I'm going to move into what's called Operation Husky 2013, but before I do this, I want to ask uh, who over here is Italian, of Italian origin? Um, Ah, ah, perfect, great, because I'm half also. We're looking at, it's pretty much the same uh, thing. I was never an FBI, a full-blooded Italian. No, apparently, uh, I was always called the, I was the Latin guy. Hey, the Spanish guy. Although my last name is Nicaragua. So, anybody from Origins in Sicily? Oh, my God. You? No? Okay, okay, good. Capo Basso? Yeah, there we go. Okay, good, good. The reason I ask, you'll see, you'll see eventually later. Operation Husky was the operation coming from the Allies. If you guys know who the Allies were during World War II, it was we're talking about England, we're talking about Canada was part of England, talking about the United States, also Russia, France, going against the Axis, which in the beginning was Germany, Japan, and Italy. Italy was on the other side. They were, we were fighting them until this Operation Husky. Operation Husky is when the Canadians went over and liberated Sicily, and then eventually with the rest of the Allies, and then Italy came on our side, and we liberated the rest of Italy. So this is what I'm going to talk to you about a bit today. Oh, you can also just use the board if you want. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to make sure I reference with a good point on, on what actually everything happened. As the, Italian, the Canadians, we were never many, many people, like, our army is very small compared to the Americans, compared to the British and all that. But we're known for, for our efforts, for our value, the fact that every soldier is worth, like, pound for pound. You know, if you hear that in boxing, this is a pound for pound, pound for pound, one of the best boxers in the world. It means that, although we're not a million people like the Americans, soldier per soldier, we're one of the best in the world. And I'm not just saying that just for Canadian forces, there's others that have told us, even the Germans have told us after we beat them. They're like, you guys are better than the Americans and whatnot. Uh, so, in the beginning, they, these guys, it was like, it was 1943, early 1943, so 69 years ago. The Allied generals, they were in North Africa, so pretty much, I'll go to the map right here. There was the war of North Africa that was occurring right here. And after, the, after they had beat the Germans in North Africa, they're now planning to take and invade Italy. Part of the strategy was that you had 
the English and the British coming in from Western Europe. Now they wanted an entrance from south, from Italy, going in so they can encircle the Germans and eventually take over Germany. So they're planning to take this invasion. Around 20th of, Ju 20th of June, 1943, they decide we're going to take Sicily. They decide to go from North Africa and they're going to be going that way. 25,000 Canadians were sent for the first time and they were leaving from England. And they created what was the largest armada in history at that time. 2,500 ships. 160,000 men are literally, when you watch the movie Troy, I don't know if you guys are any other war movies, you know when you just see ship and ship and ship in the waters heading towards land, that's exactly what was happening in the Mediterranean. The largest at the time. Now, their, their intentions were to... Oh wait, yeah, let's use this. So these are some pictures of the uh, 20, 25,000 Canadian men. Yes. So the Armada, you said the biggest one had Canadians and British, or just like only... And Americans. Oh, so all three of them were that Armada coming to Sicily? Yeah. Out of the 160,000 men, uh, you had Americans, you had British, and you had uh, Canadians in there. So these are some uh, Canadian men that were uh, actually relaxing before they were leaving. So these 25,000 men in, did not know where they were going. And this is Sicily. This is where they're arriving. They were going to arrive in... Aquino, with, if you notice, in red is with the trajectory that the Canadians took, the dotted red is the British, and the green is the American. Now, the idea, they told the Canadians, okay guys, you know, we know you don't have much experience, the only experience the Canadian soldiers had before this time was in a year before, 1942, in what's called the Raid of Tiet. I'm from a regiment here in Montreal called the Fusil Mont Royal. It's a Francophone regiment. It's pretty much the castle that you see like on Avenue de Pain downtown. It really looks like a castle. And what we what we had, one of our responsibilities was the raid on Ziet. We didn't have much experience. It's pretty much we went into France, once again by boat, to try and take France out. In the end, the Germans saw us coming. I won't go into details, it wasn't our fault. And a lot of our men passed away. The seven, uh, 70th anniversary of that raid on Ziet was this year, it was August 19th, 1942. And so seven years later it was this year, and uh, we had a commemoration there. It's m most probably, probably the last time we're going to have something, commemoration that important. The veterans from those, from those years, uh, they're just old. You know, like you see them, they're 91, 92, 94. Um, I was with one just last year for Remembrance Day, I was with them to commemorate and to talk about that. And he passed away a month later. I was probably one of the last military individuals I got to spend time with him. And the stories, that's for another time. I'll tell you the stories these guys went through. Escaping and getting caught again and escaping again. And they, they went through a lot. So now the Canadians are being tested and they're saying, okay, you're going to take Pekino. You're going to have the Americans on your left. You're going to have the British on your right. You'll be supported. What we call this is your flank are supported. So when you're going in, if I'm going this way, I'm looking in front of me, but I want to make sure that to my right and to my left I'm protected. So I'm like, okay, Americans, good, you're protecting me on my left. British, good. So I'm, I'm going to go in and start attacking. What they didn't say is that you're arriving on July 10th, 1943, but the American and the British are coming in later. So when the, when the Canadians came in first, eventually five days later, five days later they were protected. But when they first got there, they were all by themselves. Sometimes generals play pawns with some people, and that's, that's what happened with us with the Canadians. But we were so great that we only lost 10 men. And when I say only lost 10 men, it's because just a year later, we lost 112 just on the first day. So losing 10 compared to 112 is, it was great. So we started making our way in through the, uh, through the alleyways. Park West Beach is in Aquino. Where um, so that's how we that's how we actually embark on Kino. They had these big tanks, they had these big ships that had these tanks inside, and then they embark. And then the problem is that look, this tank was arriving on sand. A lot of them would get stuck, so the soldiers had to get out and have to go and fight themselves. It was very tough as well because these soldiers. Uh, along the way, a lot of their tanks got lost at sea. It's, you know, you have storms on the seafronts, uh, sea and 
they just sunk. So a lot of their ships, a lot of their supplies were gone. And our Canadian soldiers, I don't know about you, but our summers are hot. But has anybody been back to Italy during summer around the months of July and August? How hot is it? Is it hotter than here? Yeah. Let's see. Especially Sicily, you're in the Mediterranean. You're right, they're not used to that climate. So Canadians came from pretty much the UK, which is almost the same kind of temperature as us, get onto the beaches, their ships are lost, their supplies are lost, they're walking in the streets, it's 40 degrees uh, dry outside. They, it took them, after they took the beach, it took them a few days to rest. Uh, I had a story yesterday because I went to uh, a special event with a, a guy who actually was on that beach. He's 94 years old and he's still walking, still talking. This guy's incredible. I think he was on CTV yesterday. He's, he's an amazing individual. And he bought and he was explaining to me that they didn't have any supplies. So they used to go up to the Carabinieri. Do you know who the Carabinieri are yeah. in Italy? It's like the police officers. And they went in and they had to actually arrest people. Well, not arrest, but take their stuff away. Like, I need your car. Uh, I need, but you were allowed to, if you got your car taken away, you would hand them a little receipt, say, I took your car away, Canadian forces, this and this and this, take this, you'll get paid later. And they did, they were going to get paid later, but literally, they had to stop people so they can actually travel and go from one place to another. For food, people were, uh, the Italians were, well, you know, you guys probably know, Italians, um, someone hungry coming into your house is not, uh, not a problem to be fed. <laughs> you'll be trying more than you can, and maybe you won't even be able to fight after because you're so full. So uh, that wasn't a problem, and the, the Canadians, uh, the, the Italians really welcomed the Canadians and helped them out along the way, because they didn't want to fight. At this point, Mussolini had gone crazy in their eyes, and they didn't want to be part of the war. So it was pretty easy. The, the, uh, the Canadians, had a, after taking the beach, they were pretty, pretty good going along the way, going to Modica, going to different, different cities, until they met the Germans. On July 16th, they had their most, their most ferocious fight. Um, the Germans, I will have to say at this point, they were not ready for the, the Allied forces to come in. Like I showed you on the map, you have Sicily at the bottom, picture the boots, you have Sicily. Then you have Sardinia. You guys know where Sardinia is? It's like, it's the other islands that are to the west of Sicily. So you have the boots, you have Sicily, then you have Sardinia, and you have Corsica. So, the actual Germans thought we were going to come in through Sardinia and Greece. The reason for that, because the, the British and everybody else, the Allied forces, had, had something called Operation Mincemeat. Operation Mincemeat is what they did, they dressed up a British soldier, dead British soldier, they took his body, dressed him up, put secret documents in his pockets. And the secret documents said that the Allied forces are not going to be invading Sicily, that they're going to be invading through Sardinia and Greece, and they sent it on the shores of Spain. They wanted the Germans to take it, to read the secret documents, so the, the Germans would think, oh, they're not coming into Sicily, they're coming in some, somewhere else, and they're not going to be planning, they'll have least resistance when, they, when, they came, when the Allied forces are going to come in. So the Germans actually bought it. But although there were still Germans there, the only reason the Germans were there is because they were taking their troops from Italy and they were going to bring them to Greece. So we still had to face some Germans, and it was very intense. We faced them on July 16th, but it was, we lost, we, although we lost many men during this fight, uh, they, the Germans took a heavy beating because they weren't expecting us, and we fought through the streets. Once again, if you guys went to Italy, the streets are really small. They're made for a donkey, maybe two, to pass side by side. Uh, tanks like this are very difficult to pass by, so to actually, to actually get to different places, to actually move forward with these tanks, you have to blow down houses. Right, so the Battle of Artona was literally, okay, boom, we have to, the Germans were already had their positions, we had to blow down houses to move in, or we had to send the soldiers, and house by house, floor by floor, go in through the walls, mouse trapping, as they called it, to go and find every single German possible. So the Canadian forces continued, they continued on. Actually, it was a big fight, and yesterday, when this presentation was actually occurring, the veteran that I was there, 94, 94 years old, the guy was in front of him. And he's like, I was at Jida, I was there. And he was like screaming, he's like, I was there, I was just around the corner. <laughs> and another amazing thing, there was a painting, there's different paintings from the Molson family that they don- donated to the regiments across Quebec uh, mostly, about different points of different parts of the war. Like our, uh, our Fusée Mauvoir actually has our own painting, it was on display yesterday. And there was another painting for the Royal 22nd Regiment. That painting has a specific moment in the war that, and I think it was in Artona, 
that was uh, relevant for them. And that guy, that, that, that guy, sir, the sergeant who then became an officer, was um, injured in that exact painting. So the guy literally said, he was like, you see over here? And I was like, right in front of the church? Smart for you. You see right in front of the church? I got hurt there, I got my legs blown off. You know, well not blown off, but like smashed, you know, and then he had to go into rehab. And so he had this all, and he was explaining exactly where he was. 94 years old, the guy still remembers everything along the path. Not only the people's names that passed away and everything, but exactly what happened, where he went, the names of the cities. He told me he knew exactly where they were 69 years ago. And I'll come back to that later, to this day, in Italy. These are French-Canadian individuals that now speak Italian. So, Operation Husky 2013 is to celebrate the 70th, commemorate the 70th anniversary of that, uh, that raid, that invasion of Sicily, and then eventually that became what's known as called the Italian Campaign. The Canadians, we lost 562 people that are still, that lay there, and the intention is to go back there and commemorate them this year. So, in next year, July 10th, we're going to have a ceremony at the beach of Pekino. First, th this, uh, this about come on. First, uh, I know, I know some words in French, military, uh, in French. The first landing, the first landing, so July 10th in Burkina. Have something along these lines, commemorate, commemorate our presence there. And then, the 562 or whoever, as many people as we can get, will walk for 20 days, because the whole campaign took 20 days. Well, 20 days to get to the final location through the mountains of Catania, the plains of Catania, all the way to a final destination, to Ajira, where we're going to have the final presentation. These are the same, the same path that the Canadian soldiers took to the mountains, carrying weight and all that. So that's the, that's the intention, that we're going to bring the Canadians, make them march, because they marched. And then finally, at our Canadian War Cemetery, because we do have Canadian War Cemetery there. That's where all 562 members of the Canadian forces that passed away are there. The intention is to have 562 Canadians, in, one in front of every, every tomb, every cross. And uh, they're going to do a roll call. So what happens in the military in the morning or before, every, uh, before an event, they have a list and they call your name and you say present, you know. And these soldiers are no longer present physically, but we're going to roll call them again, and there's going to be that Canadian representing them in front of them that will say present for them. And we'll continue that commemoration. Uh, also at the same time, there is a commemoration there for Allied forces, but the Canadians don't have a big presence. So we're trying to raise funds so that we can, not us, but the organization is raising funds, so we can have artifacts like showing that, hey, we were here too, and that it was important for this for us as well. Finally, we're going to go to Ajita and we're going to have a reenactment of when the town was freed from Nazi rule and the Canadians were there with the whole band and everything and we're going to have that reenactment there uh, to commemorate the 70th anniversary of that happening. So that is pretty much the, uh, the gist of all that. And the reason I had asked you for, the reason I had asked you for what origins we were from, because this is a part of the history, like I didn't know this until I joined the Canadian Forces and until I found out. I used to hear stories when I was a kid from my grandmother, mostly, that uh, during the war the Germans came to our town and that they did certain things. I remember they, I'm not going to repeat what they did, what she told me, but, but every town has their own story. And, and then she said, yeah, and then there was an, another, other soldiers that came by and I remember that they, uh, they were looking for Germans, you know, and they'd come in, and I'm like, oh yeah, well that's cool, you know, but I never knew who they were. Only did I find out later, those soldiers that came through my town, in Pietacatella and um, Capogasso, 1,000, 1,200 people, were Canadian soldiers. A lot of you guys, if you have your grandparents and you ask them about the war, if you're from that region, uh, ask them, and they'll probably tell you, the soldier, that there was a soldier that passed by, that freed either physically, or came after the Germans left, those soldiers are probably Canadian. So by that time, like, like the Italians were like with the Canadians, they didn't like the Germans anymore. Exactly. The, Canadi uh, the Italians basically then switched to, uh, to the Allied forces, and so you didn't have Italians um, 
fighting the Canadians anymore. They're either fighting alongside the Canadians or just not fighting them at all and supporting them along the way. So, yeah, they then became, uh, in our eyes, the good, the good guys. You know. Mussolini, Mussolini paid the price for that. So, once again, summer of, uh, summer of 1943, that's next summer. So this is why I wanted to mention Campo Basso. Campo Basso, in Italy, guys, it works a little, a little very similar to Canada, but before you have provinces, you have regions. So when I mention who's from Campo Basso, we always say that it's similar, it's closer, like you get it more like, precise. But let's speak of the region where Campo Basso is from. It's like uh, near Rome, central. Yeah, it's central, and but like Rome is part of Emilia Romagna. That's the that joke that I joined in Emilia Romagna. Campo Basso is part of Molise. Uh, in Molise, you have two provinces. You have, like in Quebec, we have you know the province of Quebec, and so we have the province of Campo Basso, and you have the, the province of Isernia. Now, the capital, just like in Quebec, the capital of Quebec is Quebec City. The capital of Campo Basso is Campo Basso, so Campo Basso City. Campo Basso City, and this is a picture taken from Campo Basso City, almost 69 years to the day. Let's say to let's say for fall around this time, and I don't you can't really see it there, but it says Canada Town. Campo Basso City was known as Canada Town or Maple Leaf City because it was the headquarters of the Canadian forces once they got to that point, and it was from there that they then would get all the, logistically they would get their food, they would get their supplies, everything sent to Campo Basso for them to continue on further on to the other wars to take on the rest of the group. So we have a deep connection with Italy, not just because we are of Italian origin, some of us are from the East End, but because the twin city to Campo Basso is Ottawa. There are sister cities and there's ways. That the fact that we, as Canadians, helped shape what's a bit of Italy at that time, and we helped after to reconstruct, we freed them, and they remember us dearly. I went to Campo Basso, it's about an hour and a half away from my, my town, and you can, when they hear you from your Canadian and your Canadian forces, the respect is, and I, I didn't even know about this when I went, so now I know why. And so, just to tell you that we have a connection to, the Canadian Forces has a connection to Italy, that where I go training, it's, it's, a, uh, it's in Quebec City, and our training grounds are all, all Italian names. I didn't understand. Monte Saran, Monte uh, Saint, uh, Saint Leonardo, because that was one of the cities that they had crossed. These Canadian Forces, the French Canadians that freed Italy, Named their own training grounds after the places that they went and they freed. So we have this deep connection. It's just, for, it's just for you guys to know. And next year we'll be commemorating this. And there might be stuff I'll be doing with Rockwell. We'll see what happens, you know, to try and commemorate this as well. I think it's something very important. So if you guys have any questions, I'm here to ask about anything. You can ask me. It doesn't have to be enforced for anything, anything. I'm just going to take questions until the end of the class. Do you think our, our like, grandparents have agreed here after knowing? I get like like the things that get things from like Hamas so like also Italian. Like, 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 like. It's possible. It's a, it's possible. They said, oh, you know, like yeah, that's this connection with uh, with Canada. I know it was also probably primarily due to where they could get a visa. It was a little tougher. Also, I think primarily, yeah, I would love Canada, but uh, Argentina. If you give me one first, uh, I'm going there. Uh, from there, after they moved, I know a lot of uh, families, at least from the Campo Basso region, they got uh, visas to go to Venezuela. See, I'm half Venezuelan. So that's half time happened as well. So pretty much you can, you can see the connection there. You know, like, oh, okay, Italians went to, there's a lot of Italians in Venezuela, some stayed, married Venezuelans, you know, and, and whatnot, and, and then they emigrated here. So that's where you see my, my connection and how it works. And then after they moved to Canada, or people did Australia, Canada, Argentina, Canada. Why is it called uh, Operation Husky? Uh, Operation Husky? Yeah. Yeah. Really, uh, why Operation Mince Meat? Uh, they just they throw up operation for whatever. Yeah, Husky. This and the good question. I was thinking. I was trying to make the connection because you try and make a connection. At least that it sounds indigenous for us. Husky. I'm thinking maybe because they knew the Canadians were going first. We we're known as uh, what we're known as Eskimos. You know, like uh, by non-Canadians, or like they call us whatever. You know, like eagle. Eagle. We live in eagles. And so I'm thinking Husky. And I'm thinking you know maybe you know, northern dog. You know. So in their head they're like, okay, this is the one the Canadians are taking, you know. So, but good question. I'll look into it. Maybe uh, I'll find something. Good question. Before or no? I have a question. Yes. You mentioned that there were going to be representatives for uh, those that fell. 
Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would love them to be students, and I would love them to be uh, students from uh, my old high school as well. Uh, I'm going to look into it. Uh, they're, I know they're, like yesterday what we had, had the, um, the Minister of National Defense, the Honorable Peter McKay, yesterday at uh, an event here in Montreal. It's Canada company that's organizing this. That's at the chart, uh, Charter of Rights. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Cool. English and French? That's English and French, yes. Yeah. So he was there yesterday to raise funds uh, for this, so that's the, uh, we'll see. I'm literally going to see how, how that works and I, if you go on the site, there's a place I think where you can enroll and then from there they can give you more information, but I'll definitely be circulating information, at least for NASA. I'm not supposed Do to be biased. Do you also let No, I don't, I don't think they're necessarily going to go that way. Um, might be open to people like volunteers and whatnot. I, there's a little issue right now just because they're wondering are they going to bring some military people or is the military going to go on their own so we're just going to free up the spots for everyone else. But if uh, there is this Canada company, canadacompany.org and from there you can see Husky opportunities. But I'll keep you guys, if you guys are interested in them. Wait, first, uh, before I ask you a question, what period is this? Sir, so, like, I'm sure Canada has more than just Sicily, but Sicily is like the most significant to Canadians, I assume, right? There was Dieppe, like I said a year before, but we, we lost a lot of men to, in order to do that. Uh, there are a lot of other battles, because we were we left for Sicily, and we, this is very big for us. We also did contribute a lot of efforts to mainline Europe. So the FMR, like my regiment, was not part of this. There, there was another regiment. We then, we took... Uh, we took the Rhine Line, which is Germany at that point, and we, our famous uh, battle at that point was Bastogne in France. So we were going to France, continental Europe, to eventually get to Berlin and Holland. So our, our big thing is Holland, where we end up. That was the last of the areas to be freed in Europe from the Nazi rule. So. But uh, Canadians, guys, you can be proud. We did a lot in World War II. Where after that, uh, we then switched and became peacekeepers, right? I don't know if a lot of you know that we were the the uh, creators of, of peacekeeping. The idea was from uh, Prime Minister uh, Prime Minister Pearson, who at that point was foreign, I think, was delegate to the United Nations, at least the foreign affairs minister, uh, foreign affairs minister to the United, uh, foreign affairs minister of Canada. Uh, there was the Suez Canal crisis, and the French wanted it because the Suez, the Suez Canal at the point at the point was the entryway to the, well the exit way to the Mediterranean to get the oil out. It was a very important port, so the French wanted it. The, um, the British had it before, and they still want to keep rights to it. The Egyptians, that it belongs to them. It's like saying the St. Lawrence Seaway. And you have the French and the, and the British that are there, and they are like, you oh, know, this belongs to me, this belongs to me. And, and us were like, no, this is ours. This is ours. It's our St. Lawrence Seaway. So the Egyptians are like, this is ours. I don't know why you guys are fighting over this. We want it. Big conflict. We're going to fight each other. Canadians said, wait, let's create an army of different militaries to come in and just protect, to stop people from fighting each other. Because the Egyptians were going to come in and start, they were already like trying to kill the French, and the French were going so let's, let's stop this from happening. We're going to call these people peacekeepers. Peacekeepers are in, in Aboriginal uh, communities. If you go to Ganesataki or Ganwagi, you don't have police officers there. You have peacekeepers. It's a different mentality when you change it, you know. Are you a peacekeeper or are you like an aggressor, you know. So in, the, in Aboriginal, circles, peacekeeping is to, okay, we're not fighting, I'm not going to come in and take you down, we're just going to try and support. We need that 214. 214. So, we took that concept of peacekeeping, put it internationally, and that was our future for 30 years. And just recently now that we take something different into make it Afghanistan, a different combat. So. I have a question, it's yes. more of a Yeah, it's uh, it was uh, it's definitely a move that that changed from our previous. Uh, this this operation in, in this case, some of us some of us call it a war, others don't call it a war. But what how this started, how Afghanistan started, is that we're a member of NATO. NATO is a North North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and that happened was during the Cold War when you had the Russians 
on one side and the Americans on the other, and you had communism and capitalism, you had uh, our side have an alliance with other countries. So in there you have Germany, you have England, you have France, you have the US, you have Canada, you have a bunch of different countries all together. And their model was an attack on one is an attack on everybody.